All right, chat GPT. I've heard a lot of stuff about you. Let's see if you can help me edit a landscape photo in Adobe Camera Raw. So let's see here. All I gotta do here is type, how do I edit a landscape photo in Adobe Camera Raw? Huh, look at that. Okay, to edit a landscape photo in Adobe Camera Raw, you will first need to open the photo in Adobe Camera Raw by selecting Open in Camera Raw from the File menu in Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Bridge. So I'm in Bridge. First thing I need to do here, right click, Open in Camera Raw. Once the photo is open in Camera Raw, you can make adjustments to various settings such as exposure, contrast, and white balance. You can also try making selective adjustments using the adjustment brush or graduated filter tools. Good to know. Let's see here. Let's start by adjusting the white balance by clicking on the white balance dropper. So here is the white balance dropper and it tells me that I need to select a neutral area in the photograph. This is definitely not a neutral area because you can see how blue my photo is getting. I think what I need to, to select here is either something white or gray. So something neutral in the white area might be that area of snow back there. Snow is relatively white. Okay. So that looks pretty good. Warms our image up a little bit. Adjust the exposure by moving the slider to the right or left to increase or decrease the overall brightness of the photograph. Okay. That's brighter and that's darker, brighter, darker, not very helpful. Increase the increase or decrease the contrast by moving the contrast slider. Again, not helpful. It doesn't really tell me what to do here. Let's see if, hold on. Let me see if we can get a little bit more specific. How should I be using each slider? When editing a landscape photo in Adobe Camera Raw, each slider serves a specific purpose. Okay, cool. Here is a brief overview of how to use each slider. White balance. This tool adjusts the color temperature of the image. Use the dropper to select the neutral area we did. Exposure this is getting a little bit more specific. This slider adjusts the overall brightness of the image. Move the slider to the right to increase the exposure. Okay. Move the slider to the left to decrease the exposure. Okay. And make it darker. Okay. So brighter, darker, brighter, darker. I like what's going on back there in that sky when I get darker, but I don't like what's happening when I brighten up the foreground. So let's move on here. I'm not going to do anything with this. I'm just leave it back to zero contrast. This slider adjusts the difference between the light and dark areas of the image. Move the slider to the right to increase the contrast to make the image more dramatic. I want drama. So I'm going to move that up, baby. All right. All right. I'm going to move it up. Okay. Highlights. This slider adjusts the brightness of the image. Uh, so move the slider to, to the right to increase the brightness or to the left to decrease it. So this is going to be in the highlight areas. I kind of like it when we go negative. You see, I get that sky back. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, shadows, this slider adjusts the brightness of the dark areas of the image. I'm guessing it's going to tell me to move the slider to the right to make it brighter, move it to the left to make it darker. So I'm seeing a trend here in all the things it's telling me. Obvious trends here on how to move these sliders. We'll go there, okay? Now it goes down to clarity. It skips texture. You might be wondering, why is this chat GPT skipping texture? Well, a couple things before we move on. This goes back to 2021. It doesn't do any information after 2021. So if something new has happened to a program, it more than likely won't be in here because it only accesses data for things before 2021, specifically with events. But I'm assuming it's happening the same thing here because we don't see uh, a, a, a texture slider here. So. Uh, clarity. This slider adjusts the sharpness and definition of the edges in the image. Okay. Uh, move the slider to the right to increase the clarity and make the image more crisp. I like crisp. You know, if you haven't gotten an air fryer yet, I highly recommend it because my uh, my kids, they, they love their chicken nuggets in the air fryer. I should just call it the clarity appliance from now on. I'm going to tell the kids it's not an air fryer anymore. It's the clarity. You're going to put your... Uh, your, your chicken nuggets in there to get more clarity. They need to get more clarity so they can be more crisp. Okay. <laughs> They're going to be like, dad, what are you smoking? Okay. Vibrance. The slider, this slider adjusts the saturation of the less saturated colors in the image. Move the slider to the right to increase the vibrance and make the colors more saturated or to the left to decrease it. Definitely a trend here. I, I don't really need to read that anymore. I just need to read the uh, labels on what's going to happen. So if I move it to the right, it's going to increase the saturation in the colors that aren't nearly as saturated as the rest. So that's a pretty good tip there. I like that. Okay. Remember, these are only basic guidelines. Well, if they're only basic, I wonder if this thing can do anything more advanced. Okay. So do you have any advanced tips? 
Here are a few advanced tips for editing landscape photos in Adobe Camera Raw. Use the adjustment brush and graduated filter tools to make selective adjustments to specific areas of the image. For example, you can use the adjustment brush to increase the exposure and saturation of the sky while decreasing the exposure and saturation of the foreground. Now, if you are new to Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom and you're looking for an adjustment brush or graduated filter tool, you're no longer going to find it in the place that it used to be. It used to be up here. Remember that back in the day? Gosh, that was crazy. Uh, right now it's actually in the masking section. So we click this, we go to the masking section and in here we actually have something that says sky. So I'm just going to click it for grins and it looks like it's making a selection there. Pretty good selection for my sky. So with that selection made for my sky, I'm just going to follow exactly what it tells me to do here. It tells me that I should increase the exposure and saturation of the sky. So increase the exposure, increase the saturation. All right. And then it says while well, decreasing the exposure and saturation in the foreground. So I need to make a foreground selection for this. And I don't really want to go through the process of making that. So I'll just give you a little tip here. These three little dots, click them inside there. There's this thing that says duplicate and invert the mask, meaning it's going to duplicate this mask, but it's going to flip it. So now this is only affecting our foreground area. Now it says here in the foreground area that we should be basically reducing the amount of uh, exposure and saturation in the foreground. So I'll bring this down. Okay. And then I'll bring this down. All right. It's not exactly what I would teach, but okay. Now we need to take advantage of the HSL or hue saturation sliders to fine tune the colors in our image. The hue sliders allow to change the colors in your image. The saturation sliders increase and decrease the saturation and the luminance sliders allow you to adjust the brightness of specific colors. There is actually no HSL adjustment anymore because we don't live in 2021. We're in 2023. There's actually this thing here called the color mixer. So we're going to go into the color mixer here. And here we can adjust the hue and the saturation and the luminance of the colors. I'm just going to stick to orange here because it's predominantly orange and blue. And here I'm going to change the hue of those oranges to make them a little bit more of that reddish warm there. And then give them a little boost in saturation because I lost that saturation when I decreased the saturation here. So we'll just increase it. And then the luminance of the orange to uh, increase the brightness of those oranges. I actually like that when it's increased a little bit. But let's see what happens with our yellows. I'll decrease the yellows while increasing the luminance of the orange. That's just a tip for me because I like to uh, look at colors on the color wheel and uh, work with them independently, but also piggyback off of each other. So while I'm making the oranges brighter, if I decrease uh, the brightness of the yellows, it tends to kind of bring them together a little bit. So, you know, just a little tip there that AI isn't going to teach you. Now use the curves adjustment to create more dynamic contrast. So let's go into curves and let's just make some more dynamic contrast. Okay. So I'm going to use the curve, the point curve here to make the contrast more dynamic. Okay. Usually an S curve does that. Use the split toning sliders. We don't have those anymore. Split toning is now in color grading, but let's go down to color grading and see what it says here. Uh, we can use this to, um, create a specific color tone on highlights and shadows. Doesn't say anything about midtones. The reason why is because split toning in the past was only highlights and shadows. So let's go into our highlights and let's see what happens if we add a little bit of this warmth to those highlights there. I like that a little bit, a little bit of warmth to those highlights and let's go into our shadows and let's just do the opposite. And this is a tip that AI is not teaching us, but to color grade here, it's a good idea sometimes to use opposite colors on the color wheel. So we're cooling down those shadows to push them away and warming up those highlights to bring them forward. Not in AI. This didn't tell me that. Uh, make use of camera profiles. Let's not get that far in depth. Come on now. Uh, remember, these are advanced tips and should be used with care as they can easily create an over-edited image. I think we're getting close to that. Try experimenting with different settings to see what works best for your particular image. How do I know it works best for my image? I mean, I, I guess I know because I've been doing it for 20 some years. How do I know what works best? Okay. Determining what works best for your particular image can be a matter of personal preference and experimentation. However, there are some general guidelines and best practices. I like this. Start with a good quality image. Make sure the original image is well exposed and in focus before making any edits. Okay, so this is definitely in focus and well exposed. So I'm guessing here, if, if it wasn't, we shouldn't edit it. So if you do any uh, intentional camera movement, that's going to be a blurry photograph. So don't edit it. Okay, you don't even want to edit that in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, if it's not well exposed, like if you're going high key, like a high key portrait, don't even bother editing it because that's what AI is telling us here. Keep it natural. Well, it can be tempting to push the sliders to their maximum values. It's important to keep your edits looking natural. Avoid making drastic changes to exposure, white balance, or saturation. So 
every other slider you can make drastic changes to just don't make anything drastic to your exposure white balance or saturation because if we do go in here and we make a drastic change to our exposure it's going to look really bad right uh, if we make a drastic change to our saturation it's definitely going to look bad uh, if we make a drastic change to our white balance it's definitely going to look bad so we don't want to do that uh, but everything else I mean, no holds barred there. You can do whatever you want with any of the other uh, sliders here. It doesn't say anything about that. So we're, we're good there. Um, compare your edits to the original. Yeah, that's a good tip, I guess. You know, the way I like to look at my before and after is there is a before and after thing down here. But I actually just like to go to uh, reset to open and then press command or control Z and get everything back. So I think we did a better job. I mean, it looks better, but it is a little over the top. And I think that's actually coming from... Our curve, yeah, our curve. I'm gonna reset the curve, alter option and reset the curve. It is telling me now I can assess those things, so I will do that. Um, and then it says here to uh, experiment, experiment. It's a big one, I always tell you guys to experiment. But I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, okay? Because um, I'll often make YouTube videos and for some reason people don't experiment. They just say things like, well, you did this on a landscape photo, how would it work on a portrait? I don't know, experiment on a portrait. Or they'll say like, I, I see that you use this on a portrait. How would I use this in an architecture image? I don't know. Experiment on an architecture image. I mean, I do know because I use all my techniques on all types of images of any genre. But if I think sometimes people need things to do it for them like chat GPT. So what if I don't want to experiment? Okay, let's see what it says. If you don't want to experiment with different settings while editing your landscape photos, there are a few options you can consider. Sweet. Use presets. Uh, Adobe Camera and Lightroom have a wide range of presets, okay. Uh, there's some free and there's some paid. Follow a tutorial. That's a good good tip. There are many tutorials available online that walk you through the process, uh, kind of like this one. By following a tutorial, you can learn how to edit your images in a specific way without having to experiment on your own. Gee, oh, what would the world be without experimentation? Hire a professional. So if you don't want to spend the time editing your photos yourself, you can hire a professional to do it. How about this? How about you hire me to experiment for you using something I've already taught you. That's a novel idea. Put some money in my pocket for doing absolutely nothing. With that being said, chat GPT, who makes the best Photoshop tutorials on YouTube? There are many great photographers and educators who make Photoshop tutorials on YouTube. So I wonder if F64 is gonna be on here? <laughs> Flurn, of course. Yep, yep, we knew that. Uh, Tutved, oh, yep, of course. Pixie Make. Well, I've never heard of them, but apparently I'm not on here. Adobe Creative Cloud, they actually do make some pretty helpful ones, but they're just like cookie cutter, like do this to do this. It doesn't give you any like why behind it. Gavin Hoy, I don't even know who that is. I'll have to look at that. Uh, Julian Cost, yeah, she's awesome. She's actually really funny too. Uh, t -t 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 those are a few examples, and I didn't see me on there. Let's just ask it straight up then. Is F64 Academy a good YouTube channel? F64 Academy is a YouTube channel that offers photography and photo editing tutorials. The channel is known for its high quality and informative tutorials, yes, which cover a wide range of topics such as landscape photography, portrait photography, and photo editing using Adobe Lightroom. I don't do Lightroom tutorials. And Photoshop. Many users have praised the channel for its clear and concise explanations as to, you know, this is really nice that it decided to tell me all this stuff, but I don't even know if I can believe it when it said that I do Lightroom tutorials. I've done over 3,000 videos between Vimeo and YouTube, and I don't think I've done a single Lightroom one. So there's that. Thanks, ChatGPT. Thank goodness I've got a mat there. <laughs> could have broken my phone. So, you know, this whole chat GPT, this uh, AI stuff, I think it's great. I think it's great in the, the time that we're living in and the ability that we have afforded to us using artificial intelligence. But I think what you realize from the things that I was reading is that you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. There is nothing that's going to replace learning from somebody who knows all the ins and outs and has learned from not only their own mistakes, but the mistakes of others to help you make your photos better. And that's what we do as photo educators. I want you to understand that, you know, many of us out here, like myself and many others, like Matt Klaskowski and I, I guess Gavin Hardcastle, we do uh, these videos for you because we want to give you our knowledge so that you don't have to do the same things that we did. You know, and oftentimes it, these videos don't come just out of the blue. 
just by typing some uh, some chat in there. We spend a lot of time creating these things so that you can do them. I jest about the idea of experimentation, but it is really frustrating when someone takes hours of their time to create you a video and you don't bother experimenting with it. So I think the thing that we can gather from this is that while AI can give us a great starting point uh, to edit our images, especially with this chat GPT thing, you are going to need to dial in specifics. You can't just go for the the face value of moving a slider to the right and to the left you have to know what happens when you move it to the right or to the left now this chat gpt is taking sources from all over the internet and piecing together some literature for us to follow the best thing you can do is still do research on your own and find youtube channels like myself and matt Glaskowski and many others out there who do a great job flarn obviously uh do a great job teaching you guys how to edit your images listen there's no replacement for what we do i know that for a fact because this image i, I probably wouldn't have edited this way if i wasn't following uh some chat script so i would highly recommend that you don't email your favorite photoshop educator and ask them to test their knowledge against something that AI AI is teaching you. Instead, I would take what AI is teaching you and experiment with it based on what you've learned from those individuals and come up with your own inferences on what is best for you and your workflow. At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about, you and your workflow. And that's what I do here on F64 Academy. I like to take very difficult things and make them seemingly simple so that you can use them in your workflow today. Unlike this video, this was surely for entertainment purposes only. But if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. And thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I do sincerely appreciate it, especially if you made it this far. It was pretty, pretty bad. I know. But I had to prove a point. Thanks.